Before I start, I'd just like to thank Martin, Jan and Matthew for their efforts putting together the Sport Performance and, and Science Reports website. It's a really useful resource and I'm happy to be able to contribute to it. Recently we published this article, um, Training Efficiency and Athlete Wellness in Collegiate Female Soccer, on the website and this presentation just aims to explain this Training Efficiency Index con uh, concept in a little bit more detail and walk you through how we calculate the metric. The reference below that, that's just the initial paper we published a few weeks ago where we first presented this TEI metric. The Training Efficiency Index, it's a really simple method for tracking athletes' response to training over time without the need for any additional interventions or tests. I will say that this metric was never meant to replace fitness testing because I definitely think there's still a need to test for benchmarking athletes or for prescribing specific training but this metric can help fill in the gap between those tests. Sometimes it's best to do less and operate in the background as best we can because we all know that no coach or player wants to do a fitness test every week, no matter how brief that test might be. Basically the TEI is just a simple integration of external and internal training load, um, which includes an exponent, X here, which is just, just puts both measures on the same scale. This is an issue that I'll explain in a couple of minutes. So this idea actually originated from a presentation that Darren Burgess gave at a conference a couple of years ago where he presented a, sl a slide that looked vaguely like this sort of simplified version where you've got every player, um, their internal and external load plotted against one another within the same session. Just by looking at the relationship between internal and external training load in any session, he could get a pretty good idea of how his athletes were traveling. So what we would do here is break this um, internal to external uh, relationship up into four quadrants. We've got the two expected quadrants, which is a high external load uh, with a high internal load, or a low external load with a low internal load. So that's what we would expect to see. But then we've got unexpected outcomes, um, a high external load with, uh, with a low internal training load, which could be indicative of fitness, or on the other hand, a low external training load with a high internal training load, which could be uh, indicative of fatigue. Now this concept was great to see and it made plenty of sense visually. However, when I tried to recreate this sort of framework with some of my own data, I came across a couple of problems. I wasn't really sure where to put the intercept for the X and Y axis and moving them around meant uh, the same player could end up in several different quadrants. Even if the intercepts were put in the, the right spot, I was coming, uh, coming to some pretty funny conclusions. So in, as an example, we, we can take two players here, player three and player seven. So player seven is in the expected outcomes quadrant, but you can see here for this, um, this is what we would expect to see this line here as a relationship between internal and external load but player seven is quite a long way from from that um, expected outcome but still within the expected outcomes quadrant whereas player three despite being pretty close to what we would expect um, this player gets put in this fatigue quadrant um, just because of where where it was located on on along that line so we sort of decided that it wasn't so much the quadrants that were important, it's deviations from this expected line. Also this internal load response, it's going to be uh, specific to the, an individual. So as a really um, general example and a pretty basic one, say an athlete, um, an external load of 3000 meters for an athlete who generally covers around five or six Ks in a session, it's going to be much, much like less taxing for that player than another player who generally only covers you know, two kilometers per session. That's an oversimplified example, but you get the idea. This sort of led us to thinking that tracking this relationship within individuals is going to be more useful. So take this um, internal and external training load data from one of our players where we recorded information concurrently using a heart rate monitor and a GPS device. So it's pretty commonly um, collected both those both, both those um, data points are pretty commonly collected by a lot of teams and clubs. The measures we've chosen here are a heart, heart rate trim measure or training impulse 
and mechanical work, which is simply a product of the athlete's speed, acceler acceleration and body mass. You don't necessarily need to use these exact variables. These were just the ones that we found to be the most closely related in our cohort. So if you also if you train inside, it, it could be a playload measure or whatever the case may be for, for your athletes. Now if we plot them against one another, you can see there's a pretty solid relationship there between the two, an R squared of 0.8, which makes a lot of sense because of the factor of time. So we've got short sessions down here and we've got long sessions up here, which probably inflates this correlation a little bit. It also poses a problem that the two variables are not on the same scale, i.e. a one unit change in X is not the same as a one unit change in Y. So we've got um, external load that's on a scale up to a, uh, 10,000 and then the um, internal load measure only goes up to a couple of hundred. So Dr. Dan Weaving and colleagues sort of tackled this, um, this sort of limitation in a, in a paper just recently. So you can check that out if you, if you want to go into a little bit more detail. but Basically, that sort of um, led to us working out this uh, training efficiency index, which just puts these measures both on the same scale. So to do this, uh, we just need to take our two variables and log transform them. It's really easy in Excel. You can just take um, the natural log, so ln of um, both the internal and the external, and you end up with a value uh, both values on the same scale. Now we see the relationship between these log transform variables, it's, it's improved, which is great, but also we get this exponent value, this, um, the slope of this line. So that's really important because that forms the exponent in our training efficiency index calculation. So when choosing your external load metrics, it is important to be careful when using threshold base, base measures. So take this speed trace from a typical um, team sport training session. If we had a cutoff of say five and a half meters per second um, as our high speed running threshold, your external load for the session would be say 100 meters of high speed running. However, that also means that the remainder of the session, which is a large portion of this particular session, remains unaccounted for. When we plot the heart rate trace over the top, it's pretty clear that even though your running speed is under that threshold, your internal load is still accumulating, which would massively skew that relationship between internal and external load. Now you're probably thinking that this heart rate trace is pretty crap anyway, with these periods that, uh, where it drops out throughout the session. I did do that on purpose because it, it, it is a limitation of using heart rate. Sometimes the data does drop out, particularly in contact sports and um, sports where there's wrestling and things like that, it's going to happen. It might require some effort to go through each trace and um, independently identify these periods, just like this. But then that begs the question, what do we do when that happens? Do we, um, do we remove that data? So we have the same issue as before. If we remove the heart rate data, the external load is still accumulating. We could try to fill in these blocks with, with an average, but then we're not really measuring anything anymore. We're just guessing those periods. So we recommend that you remove both the, um, the GPS data in the blue here and the heart rate data when the heart rate's not clean. So that might reduce this 60-minute uh, session down to, say, a 45-minute session of clean data. This can be time-consuming, but we've been able to set up our systems um, to do this automatically, which cuts down the processing time by 100 times. As an alternative, if you don't have someone who can clean your data quickly and effectively, you could use RPE as your internal load metric. It's a bit more robust because it doesn't drop out at all, but uh, it's probably not as closely related to external load as heart rate because it doesn't fluctuate throughout a session. You get one value, it's a very global measure of load. Um, but it's still a viable alternative if you don't have the resources to clean your heart rate data properly or if you don't collect heart rate data at all. So going back to the actual calculation of the TUI, here's that same um, set of training load data where it probably makes a little bit more sense now as to why we have these really small values and really large values. That's because we're only using the data that's clean. So when we take out the, um, the internal load data, we also take out the external load data. So um, that's why the, the numbers will match up. So to calculate the TUI, we're simply dividing the external load by the internal load raised to the power of that 
exponent which was calculated from the, uh, the slope of the relationship between the log transform variables. So as an example here we've got an external load measure of 3534 divided by the internal load measure of 157 raised to our exponent of 0.85 which gives us a TEI measure of 48.1. Now if we calculate that for all data points across this uh, pre-season phase, we see a pretty clear trend, a positive upward trend um, in, in um, training efficiency as a result of, of, of training. A colleague of mine, uh, Matt Jones, who's the Director of Sports Nutrition here at the Oregon Ducks, him and I have started a, um, a bit of a blog. And if you jump over to that, um, that website, which is sportperfects.com, We've got this training efficiency calculator where um, you can sort of visualize this using your own data. I'll try and get that, um, that spreadsheet attached to this video as well. But just to show you what I mean by uh, how this works. So we've got, so this is just some mock data here, so I'll get rid of that. But if we put in all of our internal load measures and then our external, and then a training day. So now we see that plot over time for, for this particular athlete. So we've got the, the individual athlete's average TEI, um, the R squared value, which is the relationship between internal and external load for this player, um, the measured slope of that relationship, which forms the exponent of the calculation. And we've also got a default slope value here. So what this default uh, slope value does is if you have less than 10 data points the the slope of the relationship between the two variables can be a bit a bit variable so we recommend that um, you only start calculating that individualized slope when you've got at least 10 data points so uh, this calculation it, it's set up to do that so it'll only only use um, the actual measured slope when you've got more than 10 data points there So just as a quick summary of where we're up to in terms of research into this metric. Um, our first step was comparing changes in the TEI against changes in fitness, where we found moderate relationships over a, a rugby league preseason period. So the fitness test we used was a 1.2k shuttle test, which is probably not the best fitness test, but it was the best we could do in our circumstance. We've also compared the TEI to um, the volume of external lo training load completed in both rugby league and also in the present paper with female collegiate soccer. So we found some small relationships there between um, the TEI and our more chronic measure of, of training load over three or four weeks, but we found no real substantial relationships when we used a, a really acute measure of training load, a, a three-day um, exponentially weighted moving average. In that same, same group of soccer players, um, we compared the TEI to our measures of wellness and also only found um, trivial relationships with sleep, soreness, and stress in these players. So overall, it seems the TEI is pretty useful for monitoring chronic adaptations to training, but it's not very good for tracking acute training status. This could be for a number of reasons, particularly when using heart rate as our internal measure, as things like ambient conditions, uh, hydration status, and possibly caffeine intake. These things could all have an impact on this relationship, but um, hopefully we'll be able to come up with some clear answers in the near future.